All right, so we're going to go ahead and talk about Unit 4, which is our Ocean Zones and Lifestyles Unit. And uh, I really like that quote in the bottom right corner that says, I find the lore of the unknown irresistible. That's a quote by Dr. Sylvia Earle. She is a famous oceanographer um, and ocean advocate. And it really does hit home with this unit because what we're going to be exploring here is the ocean zones um, that we're not so familiar with um, and why we call them zones and what makes them different from other places in the ocean. Uh, you guys think about, we know that we can find different things on the seashore compared to if we just go out a little bit further into the water. And just imagine the different things that we can find as we go down deeper into the ocean. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in this unit. Now, before we get started, I want you to go ahead and think about um, how scientists classify marine environments. And so to do that, first we have to kind of understand what a marine environment is. So an environment is just all of the organisms and all of the abiotic or non-living factors in a specific area. So an environment can be just about any area that you actually define, but it includes all of the living and non-living things interacting in that area. So go ahead and take a minute and do that, and then we can go ahead and resolve. All right, so just go ahead and pause it and then unpause when you are ready. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and take this link here. If you can't, if you want to go to it on your own, uh, go ahead and you can type that link in on your own. But we're going to go ahead and watch this now. If you have already watched it, feel free to fast forward. One, two, three, go! Faster, faster, faster. Just how deep does the ocean go? If you took the highest point on land and submerged it, you would still have more than a mile between you and the deepest point in the oceans. The oceans harbor 99% of all living space on Earth and have enough water to fill a bathtub that's 685 miles long on each side. For scale, here's a human and here's a blue whale, the largest animal on Earth. Blue whales usually hunt at depths of around 330 feet within the well-lit zone of the ocean. Deeper down, at 700 feet, the USS Triton became the first submarine to circumnavigate the Earth in 1960. At 831 feet, we reached the deepest free dive in recorded history. Down here, the pressure is 26 times greater than at the surface, which would crush most human lungs. But, but whales manage it, diving to a max depth of 1,640 feet where they hunt giant squid. At 2,400 feet, we reach the danger zone for modern nuclear attack submarines. Any deeper, and the submarine's hull would implode. 2,722 feet down is where the tip of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, would reach. A little farther, at 3,280 feet, we're deep enough that sunlight can't reach us. We've now entered the midnight zone. Many animals down here can't see, like these eyeless shrimp at 7,500 feet who thrive near scalding hot underwater volcanoes. At this depth, temperatures are just a few degrees above freezing, but the waters around hydrothermal vents can heat up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. 9,816 feet is the deepest any mammal has been recorded swimming the QVR beaked whale. But not even the QVR beaked whale could explore the RMS Titanic, which rests at a staggering depth of 12,500 feet. The pressure is now 378 times greater than at the surface. Yet you can still find sea life, like the fang tooth, hagfish, and dumbo octopus, the deepest living octopus on Earth. At 20,000 feet is the Hadal Zone, an area designated for the ocean's deepest trenches, like the Mariana Trench. If you tip Mount Everest into the Mariana Trench, its summit would reach down to 29,029 feet. That still doesn't compare to the two deepest crewed missions in history. In 2012, Director James Cameron descended to 35,756 feet for the Deep Sea Challenger mission. But Cameron didn't quite break the record, which was set by oceanographer Jacques Picard and Lieutenant Don Walsh in 1960. 
Picard and Wash descended to the lowest point on Earth, Challenger Deep, at a record 35,797 feet below the surface. Since then, scientists have sent half a dozen unmanned submersibles to explore Challenger Deep, including Pico, which collected over 350 species off the seafloor between 1995 and 2003. But scientists estimate there are potentially thousands of marine species we have yet to discover. Humans have explored an estimated 5 to 10 percent of Earth's oceans. We've only just begun to understand the deep, dark world that flows beneath us. All right, so fun fact there, uh, that whole bit about James Cameron, um, you guys know that he did that as research for um, Finding Nemo. So he actually did that. He Before he made Finding Nemo, he actually wanted to... Um, he wanted to learn more about and experience that the the different parts of the ocean. So he actually went down there just in order to accurately be able to make that movie, um, which is pretty cool. So hopefully you've had some time to think about this question. How do marine scientists classify marine environments? And the appropriate response to that um, is by physical features and the most um, the most common one, the easiest one that we use is the availability of light. So if you take a look, here is a representation of um, the ocean. It's not to scale at all, so I'm just going to use my mouse here. So if you look, we've got the continental shelf, and that should seem pretty familiar to you. And then here we've got the continental slope that goes down. This, is, this slope right here is representing thousands of feet. So again, this is not to scale. Um, but you see up top here, uh, near the surface, is where we have the sunlit area of the water. This is called the epipelagic zone, and we're going to talk a lot about these zones later. Um, but these little divisions that you see here, this top part that's lightest blue, this is the area where phytoplankton is at. This is where uh, seagrasses and corals and stuff can exist, because photosynthesis can happen in this top zone. This only exists to like 200 meters. And then past this, we get this weird area called the twilight zone. And there's a little bit of light here, but not enough for photosynthesis. And then further down, we have the area, the aphotic zone, which is where there's no light at all. It's completely dark in that section. All right, so what you guys have available to you uh, for this unit, you will be allowed to take the uh, diagram that looks kind of like this um, and actually tape this into your uh, notebook that you can use for the exams. So you're welcome to, and encouraged to take notes directly on this diagram. It'll keep you from having to redraw this diagram um, and you can add notes to this as we go. So you guys can go ahead and make sure you have that out right now while we're doing the rest of this lecture. I want to bring a couple things into uh, your view here. Um, we've got, don't ignore Providence and ignore all of these numbers and, and fancy words here right now. But the terms that you need to understand for right now are pelagic and benthic. So pelagic is the water part of the ocean. So if you look here, we've got all this. This is all the water part of the ocean. If it's not on the ocean floor, it's pelagic. The benthic uh, term means on the bottom of the ocean. So organisms that lay on or rest on or crawl across or are attached to the bottom of the ocean are benthic. All right, so just moving forward, understand those. Quick review of continental margin. We've gone over this last unit, but you have the uh, you have the, got the continental shelf that extends from the shoreline to the continental slope, and then the continental slope uh, drops down until it hits an abyssal plain. Um, where the continental slope and the abyssal plain meet is a continental rise, and you can think of the oh. I've been inactive for too long. You can think of the continental rise as um, what would happen if you would dig a, um, a hole at the beach, right? You dig a heavily slanted hole at the beach. So you've got these great big slopes. Think about what happens to the sand on those slopes. Does it stay where it's at? No, the answer is those the sand falls down towards the bottom of the hole. And you get these little like areas where the sand gets piled up at the bottom. That is what's happening here, and that's the continental rise. Um, excuse me. Here again here, we are going to take a different look 
um, introduce a couple new terms here. Notice we've got intertidal zone. This is a new uh, vocabulary term for us, but it's not a new region for you. You've all seen an intertidal zone if you've just been to the beach. And we've all seen intertidal zones when we've gone out to Marina Jacks where the boat is parked. Um, when we go up, when we walk up, we walk past those little mangrove areas. That's all where water meets land is an intertidal zone. Um, inter means between and tidal is like in referring to like tides, like high tide and low tide. So intertidal is between the high and the low tide mark. Um, so that is where the water meets the land. The neuritic zone, which is what we consider uh, the coastal zone, um, this area is just after the intertidal zone. So when we go out in Sarasota Bay on the carefree learner, we're in the neuritic zone or the coastal zone. This is the area that, of water that's above the whole continental shelf. So off the coast of Florida, this is really wide. Remember we talked about the continental shelf extends hundreds of miles. So this neuritic zone um, is the water portion of that uh, over the continental shelf. Um, in the neuritic zone, we get lots of sunlight, we have seagrasses, we have coral reefs, it's great, okay? Past this, we don't have it circled yet, is the oceanic zone. And this is going to be the bulk of our studies for this unit because there's so much here. Um, we spend a lot of time as people uh, in and around the intertidal and neuritic zone. They're more familiar to us, but that oceanic zone is one of the places that we don't always get to go to. Um, All right, and I just kind of talked about this, so I won't spend too much time, but get used to this is the diagram that you guys should have in front of you while writing. Um, notice above neuritic zone, we've got we've got coastal zone here. We I'll take either for that. Um, the intertidal zone here is also called the littoral zone. That's the fancy word for it. I will let you guys uh, do either of those words because they're both correct. So whichever one you choose to memorize is fine. Um, this is a better representation. You can see it from the side. So we've got the high tide mark and the low tide mark here. So that's the intertidal zone. The coastal zone is the neuritic zone. And then we also have that big oceanic zone here. And then look at all of these zones that are contained within the oceanic zone. And then these numbers here represent the depth in meters. So notice that photic zone, the epipelagic zone where there's sunlight and photosynthesis happening, goes all the way down to 200 meters, which is over 600 feet deep um, where we're still able to do photosynthesis. Um, the oceanic zone contains the majority of the uh, marine organisms, um, everything from tiny little pieces of plankton all the way up to the largest marine organisms in the world, which is the blue whale. So we definitely have a lot to study there. Again, I want you to notice this little section here where it says benthic seafloor pelagic water. That's just a reminder that the stuff in gray represents the seafloor and that's the benthic zone. And then the stuff in blue represents the water and that is the pelagic zone. All right, and I think we're gonna go ahead and end for today on this slide. This is um, just gives you some characteristics of each of the zones and we've kind of already talked about them, but it's nice to have the words written down in front of you. So I'm going to give you guys some time to go ahead and write that stuff down. Uh, you can pause this video uh, if, in order to do that. That's fine. Um, start it back up whenever you're ready to hear me wrap up this part. So again, the intertidal zone is on the shoreline. And then the neuritic zone is over, neath, over the continental shelf. And then the oceanic zone is past the end of the continental shelf where the continental slope begins. Um, it contains the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean, um, and there are lots of really uh, unique organisms that live there that have gone through some crazy adaptations to be able to live there. Okay, yep, I was correct. This is where we are gonna stop today, so again, um, thank you guys for listening. Make sure that you um, take notes for this section. Uh, review it at any time that you want. And um, just know that there will be a quiz on this section, section A, um, coming up. So make sure you take that quiz on Blackboard. All right. Thanks.